Good morning, everyone. It is so good to have you here today on this bright, sunny spring day. It is now spring. Woohoo! We're, we're excited. It's almost uh, almost out of the winter. A few announcements for us today. Trivia night is tomorrow. Uh, if you're interested, come and join us. We are on Zoom. So whether you uh, are used to coming on to Zoom or you're not so used to coming on to Zoom, whether you like to come in on the phone or online, you're more than welcome to. If you don't know how to, please let me know and I will be happy to get you set up. It is fairly straightforward. So that's at seven o'clock tomorrow night. It will be 20 random questions and we'll have lots of fun with it. So I hope you'll come and join us then. Uh, next week is going to be communion. That is our Palm Sunday service. I know we're almost through Lent. And so for Palm Sunday, we'll be celebrating communion together online. Uh, so grab some juice and some bread or something vaguely related to juice and bread and come and share in the sacrament with us. A year ago tomorrow, it was our very first service on Zoom. We weren't yet on Facebook at that point um, because my internet was not strong enough to support both, but we were on Zoom as we figured out what it meant to be a worshiping community still when we were no longer in our buildings. It has been a heck of a year and I am so grateful that you have continued to be part of our community. In many ways, we have added new friends from other communities in our area and from across the country. And however it is that you have joined us, we're so glad that you do. That being said, on Easter Sunday, we are planning to resume in-person services at both congregations. Uh, that will be 9.30 at La Flesh and 11.30 at Limerick. The 9.30 service will also continue to have the Zoom and Facebook service. So if you are not feeling like you're comfortable coming out to worship um, in the building or you're not able to for whatever reason, please know that we are continuing the online services. We don't want to, to lose your participation. And so uh, we will be continuing that from the 9.30 service from La Flesh because that's the Church that has internet. So that decision kind of was, was made for us. So we hope that we will see you at any one of those services, whether that is uh, in person or continuing to be virtually. We're glad that you're here. We'll have two weeks of that, April 4th and April 11th. And then I'm taking a week of study leave. And so we will be off for the 18th. The two weeks will allow us to kind of have a little bit of a test run, see how it goes, see how people are feeling about it, and then we'll reevaluate. Of course, all of our protocols will still be in place and we'll be following provincial regulations and we'll be watching them carefully. So if something changes between now and then, then we will reevaluate. On our tech is uh, Dwayne and Penny Filson today. We're grateful to them for leading us in this way and uh, for, for taking over everything for us. The only other announcement that I have is our weekly announcement that you guys can probably quote with me by now. Our music license number is A609189 of One License LLC. And our music is, of course, reproduced with permission. Uh, Dwayne and Penny did some of the hymns and some of the other ones we were using, ones that we've done in the past. And I honestly can't remember who, who did them. So we've got a little bit of a hodgepodge again today. I am so grateful to all of our musicians who have uh, made this work for us throughout the last year. We begin our worship this morning, as we always do, by acknowledging the territory. This is something that's very important to do, and so I invite you to use the words if for Southern Saskatchewan, if that's where you are, or elsewhere to figure out where and, uh, and on what land you work and live and worship, and to acknowledge that as well. We remember today the land on which we worship. It has been the traditional land of the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, Soto, Cree, and Métis peoples for generations. As people of the United Church, we remember and repent of the harm that has been done to our Indigenous kindred, and we commit to living in a relationship built on love and care for all. So 
Friends come and worship the timeless one who calls us together in ways both familiar and new, with tried and true tradition and with fresh expressions of faith. Come, let us lift our hearts in worship. And as we come to worship, we light the Christ candle, remembering God's presence in our midst here in this time of worship and in our lives as we leave this space. Our prayer of approach this morning was written by the Reverend Carol Holbrook Prickett, as it has been throughout Lent. I invite you to say the words that come up on your screen aloud with me and to hear your voice and mine together. Let us pray. God, your faithfulness is so deep while we are so prone to wander. Direct our eyes again to the glories of your love, your covenant written on our very hearts. We return to you in worship. We seek you in praise. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is number 115 in more voices, if you have it. That is our spiral bound book. It is called Behold, Behold. scripture today is from the gospel of Luke chapter 5 verses 36 to 38. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it onto an old garment. Otherwise, the new will be torn, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new wine, but says the old is good. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As has become our tradition during this season of Lent, I invite you to think about what seeds God has planted in your life this week. How are you tending to them? How is God tending to them? Are you watering them? Are you weeding them? Are you co-gardeners with God? What seeds has God planted at the beginning of Lent as we draw near to the end of it? What seeds will continue growing in your life far after this Lenten season is done? And as always, we have here representing our inward seeds, of course, our outward seeds. They are growing as well. You can see they're getting bigger each week. And we're going to add just a little bit of water to them once again. The waters of life, the waters of creation. 
that they too might grow. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is number 10 in More Voices, Come and Seek the Ways of Wisdom. some time the other day looking back at some of the emails that I sent in those first few days and weeks of this time of pandemic and I found myself thinking about how naive we were <laughs> to all of the changes that were about to happen and to think that we, we originally suspended worship in the buildings for two weeks thinking that that would be fine and we would all be done. But as I read them, I also found myself thinking about how faithful we've been as we have changed and adapted to face those challenges head on. It is no secret that the life of the church and of society as a whole is not the same as it was a year ago. But as I heard someone say the, this week, Everyone wants to go back to February of 2020 as if they were the golden years of the church, but it really wasn't. It's just the most recent time that we believed that things were easier. If we could build a time machine and go back to February 2020, we would find that churches then were saying, I wish we could go back to whenever pick a year when everyone went to church and sunday school and the offering plate were full which got me thinking about a story that i heard once when i was a child going up for the children's time you may have heard the story or you may just know the moral of it because it's about farming but it stuck with me and i think it's something that is important for us to hear as a church today the story goes that there was a farmer who was looking to hire some help and put an ad in the local paper. Three people applied and wanting to make sure to hire the best person for the job, the farmer decided to put them to the test. So the next day, the farmer took all three of them to the edge of the field and who said whoever had the straightest furrow at the end would get the job. Wanting to do their best, of course, wanting to get the job, each applicant started out eagerly. The first was very nervous of making about making sure that the furrow was straight, and so he was constantly turning around to look and make sure that if corrections were needed, that they were made. 
Sometimes that resulted in overcorrections. The second thought that it would be best to examine the ground directly in front of them so that they could make sure that nothing interfered with the straightness of their furrow. And so they plowed with their head down, intent on making sure that they did not waver. The third looked across the field and found a tree. Lining the plow up with its trunk, they set off, glancing back periodically, but always returning their eyes to the tree at the end of the field. At the end of the day, the farmer or the furrows of the first two applicants were just like scribbles across the soil, while the third was much straighter. As two of those applicants learned, looking backwards periodically can be helpful but letting it consume our thoughts does nothing good. Being realistic about where we are now is also important, but never casting our minds to where we hope to be means that we have no direction. And Jesus knew this too. Throughout the gospels, we find a picture of a man who knew loved and held on to the traditions of his faith, but was also not afraid to go beyond them when necessary. In today's scripture, Jesus recognizes the gifts of both old and new wine and does not disparage either. He simply maintains that each needs its own proper container. Isn't that the same with the church? Old and new are not opposites of each other, two ends of a rope that we use for a tug of war. Instead, they complement each other, each with its own container, space, and a way of sharing the love of God with the world. As we move into the next weeks and months with new old ways of doing things, it's important for us to really think about who we are and what we are called to do as a church. So I thought today we could have a little bit of an exercise to get us thinking about some of this. You can choose to do it now if you happen to have a piece of paper handy or to do it later on. You can always rewatch this video. You can find it on Facebook or our, our website at www.lafleshlimerickunited.com or you can check it out on the website if you don't want to watch the video. I have included the, uh, the diagram as well as the whole sermon on there. So when you get a chance, take a piece of paper and through it, draw a big X. That is the Greek letter key, which is the first letter of Christos. You might guess that that is Christ in Greek. This will act as a reminder that Christ is at the center of everything we do as a church community. And then use the four quadrants to write the following. Why the church is important to me. Why the church is important to the community. Things to continue or start. And things to give up. And then, well, then you start filling them in. It's probably easiest if you start with the, the one that's the most personal. Why is the church important to you? If you were given a one minute spot on the radio to answer the prompt, I love my church because, and you could say anything you wanted in that one minute, how would you use your airtime? What would you tell a friend is the most life-giving part of our congregations? What makes you want to be part of this church? And if you wouldn't consider yourself to be a part of this particular church, then think about your own congregation, your own community of faith. What is important to you about it? Then move on to the next question. Why is the church important to our community? Or put another way, if we woke up tomorrow and found out that our church was completely and utterly shut down, 
fully, completely, not as it was last year when we started doing things in new ways, but just completely kaput. What difference would that make in the La Flesh and Limerick communities? If aliens came to visit and asked people in our town what our church was about, what would people at the co-op or the pharmacy tell them? Now take a look at what you've written in both quadrants so far. Do they match and complement each other? Or do they tell different stories? Think about what you want them to say if we were to do this exercise a year from now, or five years from now, or 10 years from now. How do we make that a reality? Now it's time to think about the last two quadrants on the page. What we might continue or start, and what we might give up. As you think about who and what you hope that our church will be in the coming years, some of what you write down may be very concrete. You think that we should continue or stop immediately our virtual services. That is a very concrete thing. Others might be a little bit more abstract. You think that we should stop or adopt a particular behavior or attitude as a congregation. What you write down may be a longer term idea or it may be more immediate. Maybe it's old wine that we can drink and say, this is good. And maybe it's new wine that is just as good but needs its own container to hold it without bursting. The important part in this moment is not to censor yourself as you write. Let the words flow from your heart and through your pen as you think about what we might give up or take up as a church. And then set it aside for a while. Come back to it in, in a few days and really take a good look at it. Does what's on the page reflect the one who is at the center of it? Are there things that are unrealistic that should be crossed off or set aside? Are there things that you would add to any of the, the quadrants now that you've had time to let your thoughts percolate a bit? What on that page excites you the most? What scares you the most? Where do you see God's life at work? If you feel comfortable sharing, I invite you to do so with each other. Start conversations, be open and real about what you're thinking and feeling and compassionate as you hear the same from others. If there's something coming out of this exercise that you want to share with me or with your church council, do it. And remember that these are simply starting questions for you. If your mind wanders to other places or to new questions to ask, Go with it. Let the spirit guide your thought and conversations. Because the reality is that God's life is at work in both new and old wine. So as tempting as it is for us to throw one out entirely and focus on the other, that is not actually what we are called to do and be as a church. We cannot spend all of our time looking back at what used to work, trying to fit ourselves into models of church that no longer exist. But neither can we bring in new wine to our current wineskins without providing new vessels for it. To quote Ecclesiastes, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. This season is new for the church, as has been every season that has come before it, as will be every season that is yet to come. But we will face it with courage and hope, proudly lifting high jugs of old wine that have aged well, while at the same time sowing new skins for the grapes that are currently being crushed to make the sweet new wine. We face this season learning from our past, imagining the future, 
and reveling in the moments of now where we see God at work in this world. Amen. As people of the United Church of Canada, we proclaim our faith with the words of a new creed, which once was new wine, but now seems to have become the old wine. It was written in 1968, has been adapted a little over the years, but still proclaims the faith that we hold as a church community. I invite you to say these words aloud with me. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Friends, at this time in our service each week, we take the time to offer ourselves to God, knowing that we have been graced with so many blessings, that we have been given love upon love beyond our wildest imaginations, we offer our whole selves back to God. Sometimes that is our time, sometimes that is our talents, and sometimes that is our treasure. And so I invite you this week to think about what you offer to God, how you share your life with God's work in this world. If you are looking to make a monetary donation and offering to one of our congregations, we thank you for that. Please either send it to the church or pass it along or chat with either myself or one of our treasurers and we'll get you set up for that. In this time, I invite you to think about what we offer to God as we sing our offertory hymn. Prayers of the People today was written by the Reverend Dr. Richard Bott, who is moderator of the United Church of Canada. And he writes this prayer, he posted it a couple of weeks ago, on a year of the pandemic. Let us pray. Holy One, it's been a year. A year since the pandemic hit this part of the world, and we realize that for the safety of each other and all of our neighbors, we needed to be a congregation that wouldn't congregate. Well, not in person, at least. We found other ways, old technologies like paper mail and telephone trees, and new technologies like Zooming and pastoral care by video. We found ways of being together with each other and with you. It's not the same. And there are parts of it that we're missing, but we found ways to live the ministry you have given to us, to be Jesus's disciples, to share your love with each other and with the whole world. We remember those who have died from the virus. We remember those who are ill. We remember the healthcare workers, the researchers, the grocery clerks, the delivery drivers, 
all who must work for the care of the world in their own way. We remember all those who are grieving, all those who are afraid, all those who wait. And we pray. So on this anniversary, we ask that you would help us to recognize each other and to know that in all of this, you have been, are, and always will be with every part of your creation. Give us strength to keep on. Give us grace in our frustrations. Give us hope for tomorrow. Give us life and life abundant that we might be people who live in the world, physically distanced, but socially together, faces masked, but with hearts open, hands washed, but ready to get to work you have for us, we pray. In Jesus' name, carried by the wings of the Holy Spirit and meshed in the Creator's love, we continue our prayers in the familiar words of our ancestors. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn today is number 310 in Voices United. That's our Burgundy book, God Who Touches Earth with Beauty. <laughs> go from this time of worship, giving up what used to work and no longer brings life, and taking up new wine in new wineskins. And as you go, may you go with the blessing and the love of God who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer, Jesus, who is our elder brother and our Holy Spirit of life within you this day and evermore. Amen. <laughs>